We're going to do things a little bit backwards. We're actually going to start with the end of the story, as well as the moral of the story, and then we'll go back to the beginning to take you through how we got there. And the story itself has a lot of SVP characters involved in it. So if you happen to recognize somebody over the course of the story, please make sure that you give a cheer for them. And, uh, and with that, let's begin. All right? So I'm going to start at the end and give you a snapshot of where the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences is right now. And I'm going to tell you five things. So the first thing is that we have developed, let's see if this happens, yes, we've de developed a strategic vision and a plan for reaching the goal of understanding something that is as deep and wide as the Human Genome Project. It's focused on human learning and how it is that periods in development change the ways in which we learn. We're interested in critical periods, particularly during the first five years, when windows of opportunity open for learning from, from the environment and how they close. So we're interested in the triggers for opening and why and how they close. And when a child is in a heightened period for learning, what actually goes on in their brains? So the Developing Mind Project lays out that vision and lays out a plan for achieving it. The second thing we've uh, done to date is to establish uh, campaign goals. So we set out to raise $26.2 million that would allow us to reach the vision described in the Developing Mind Project. At, as of today, we are $15.9 million towards that path. So that's the second thing. Yeah, we're proud of that. SVP has helped with that. OK, so the third thing that we did was um, what did we do with the 15.9 million? So the three critical things that an organization has to do to reach its goals. And this one shows you a picture of the first one. Now this is my partner, Andy Meltzoff and I. We're married. iLabs is our full-time baby, 24-7. And you don't see us vacationing here in Rome. We're in Rome. But this was on October 28th. We were invited by the Vatican to talk about um, neuroplasticity in the brain to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. That's a group that advises the Vatican on matters of grave importance. And this committee of 25 is composed of 17 Nobel laureates. So we were telling these group of people about neuroplasticity, particularly in the early period. What this signifies is the principle called secure the leadership. Uh, Susie will tell you later that we have two endowed chairs that allow us to make the important discoveries, spend all of our time making the scientific discoveries, and then disseminating that information worldwide to some of the most important organizations that could have an effect on delivery of that information. So the fourth thing is that we, with the funds that we raised, opened up uh, a brain imaging center uh, a $7 million center, and you see here on May 24th, the governor, uh, the president of the University of Washington, Andy and myself cutting the ribbon on a magnetoencephalography center. That's a 23-letter word, M-E-G for short. You see it here pictured. Uh, it looks like a hairdryer from Mars. Um, it is the only brain imaging um, equipment that can be used safely and non-invasively from newborns to the aging brain. We're the first in the world, as you see in that little insert, we're the first in the world to put babies in an MEG machine while we watch them learn. It is a very magical device that picks up the magnetic fields as a brain does its learning work, and we're learning tremendous things by it. And uh, the last thing we've done uh, just recently is to hire three brilliant new rocket scientists to help us with this uh, vision uh, that we have. And you'll see from their names and the places they've come from that these uh, young people are coming from the best institutions in the country, two from Carnegie Mellon and one from Harvard, who are interested in brain dynamics and are, are going to allow us to reach this goal. So you've heard the start of our happy ending. We're far from ending yes. in that happy story. And now let me tell you the moral of the story. And it's especially pertinent to those people who are considering SVP right now. The moral of the story is that if you're passionate about something and you know that it's the right thing to do, then you have to go with it. Because the right thing will then happen, regardless of the rules. And we'll talk about the rules in a minute. So 
The story started in about October of 2005. And what you're seeing there are my two delicious children, Sydney and Talia, who at the time were about five months as well as three years. And Paul had, like many of you, engaged me in SVP, and I thought the most appropriate committee to serve on would be the Early Learning Grant Committee. Anybody here serve on the Early Learning Grant Committees? Anybody? A couple people? Great, thank you. And as a part of this process, you do a lot of research into a lot of different places that are practicing that. At the same time, I had read this terrific book, The Scientist in the Crib, and it was written by these people, Dr. Andrew Meltzoff, Dr. Pat Cool, and Dr. Allison Gopnik. And it helped me understand that it wasn't no that my three-year-old was using all the time, it was other, it was his exploration of other. <laughs> so, so I was especially keen to hear from this Meltzoff guy and went to a lecture at my friend Yaffa Moritz's house and when I afterwards was so enwrapped with his information, I was very excited when she said, come for a tour at their, at their lab. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it, but that didn't stop me. What I decided was I really need to take my grant committee on a tour of this place called iLabs because we need to move upstream from the practice of early learning to the science of early learning. And we went on a tour with Pat and Andy, and we had the opportunity to hear all of their amazing discoveries at the time. And they spoke wistfully about this magical machine that would be like a stethoscope into the brains of even the youngest children. So at the end, when we were having this discussion, I had the opportunity here, I want to show you actually really quickly the, the uh, names of the people who were on the, the group at the time, the grant committee. We had the opportunity to ask them some questions. And so I just asked them what I thought was a simple question and one that being on that grant committee had equipped me to ask. And that was, what's your big vision? So if resources were no object, what would you do? And it was nothing short of what you heard before. It just took us a little while to get there. And so in terms of being able to pursue that, we all came out of this meeting. And Bill, where are you? Raise your hand, Bill. Where's Mr. He's over here. He's over there, OK. So Mr. Henningsgaard is the ultimate voice of reason. Susan? And I'm not. And so we came out of there all a buzz and wanted to immediately, or some of us, wanted to immediately turn iLabs into our grantee. They were going to be our grantee. And Bill understood that that actually wasn't appropriate. They didn't have a board. They didn't have a strategic plan. They were a part of the University of Washington. Oh, they hadn't applied. <laughs> it wouldn't be so fair. But, but so full of the fire that we all were feeling at the time, he agreed that there was a there there and that it was our moral obligation, frankly, to then follow up and put those pieces in place and to help this organization achieve that vision that still had yet to be articulated. So Bill and I collaborated with them for about a year, meeting with them to extract, and it was there, it just needed to be extracted out their vision and the strategy, to quantify that strategy, as you heard before from Pat, and then to put together the advisory board who would help bring that strategy to fruition. And you have some of the names of the, actually all of the names of the advisory board members since the start. Quite a few SVP folks and folks who probably should be an SVP as well. So that takes us to the point where we had all the pieces in place. Well, everything except one. We needed something that everyone in this room understands is that sometimes you need a catalyst. The next slide shows a catalyst. This is an article published in the Puget Sound Business Journal that described the drama at the University of Washington on the day the new Dean of Arts and Sciences, Anna Marie Kause, had entered her new job and got a phone call from me saying, well, I've got an offer, a competitive offer, a really good one from Carnegie Mellon University. And they want Andy and I to come. They're ready to give us faculty positions, uh, endowed chairs, uh, the $2.5 million piece of equipment that we need. I don't know, it's pretty tempting. So as many of you realize, competition can be a very good thing. <laughs> and it lit a fire that uh, certainly helped move us along our way. So as a board, many of you would realize, right, as a board, your job is to help the organization achieve its vision. So we were really torn. What do we do? Do we let this happen? Do we have an issue with it? Um, 
we wanted the vision of ultimately understanding the fundamental workings of the brain to happen, but we didn't really want it to happen in Pittsburgh. <laughs> so we collaborated closely with the university. We collaborated with private donors, such as the Nick and Leslie Hanauer Foundation. We also turned over every stone that we could find, including calling Paul Shoemaker, who then connected us with folks like the Bezos Foundation and with Ben and Lisa Slivka and other very important contributors to our efforts. And with that, we were able to secure the equipment. We were able to secure endowed chairs, including Pat receiving the first ever Bezos Family Foundation chair, Andy securing his temporary chair into a permanent chair. And then we were also able to assure them, and they trusted us as a result of the work that we had put in, that we would raise the remaining funds in order to fund this more abstract research that some of their national grants wouldn't cover. So it was a group effort to really bring it together in order to put all of the pieces in place for them to really have breakthrough research. All right, so I can't resist but show you a little bit of data. Uh, look at the blinking lights, okay? I'm not trying to hypnotize you, uh, but I am trying to show you how brain cells communicate with one another. So when a baby is sitting under that big hair dryer, uh, 306 squid devices, if you're a physicist, you know what a squid device is, is picking up the magnetic fields in the brain. One of the ways that brain, one area of the brain talks to another area of the brain is to listen to it fire. And when two brain areas fire at the same rate, they communicate. You fire together, in a sense, you're wiring together. What we are doing for the first time ever is measuring babies at six months and at 12 months and comparing them to adults, uh, at looking at an oscillation or brain rhythm of a particular frequency that signals their attention and effort to learn something. And what we're seeing in a dissertation that will be defended next month is that the baby brain is entrained and pays attention to things totally differently than an adult brain. Baby brains are driven by high frequency events and I'm remembering when Trey talked earlier about being told over and over again he was going to be the president or watched over and over again and was inspired by Matlock. Babies are really focused on the things that happen frequently. So that's both very exciting to understand. It's also a bit of a warning. It's a bit scary to understand that what we put in front of kids frequently, and particularly when it's a person putting it in front of them, makes a huge difference. As adults, frequency doesn't matter anymore. What happens to an adult is the learned categories. You try to take all of your experience and you attend to things that belong in the learned categories. When things come around that you're not familiar with, your brain starts to work very hard at attending to the new thing. So this is just a teaser portion of what we're gonna be able to learn uh, as we uncover the secrets of the human mind. Thank you. So this takes us to the end of the story and where we are today, and this is not just our story, this is all of our story. And individuals who are passionate about something that we know is right, everybody in here is someone who will specifically go and pursue and make sure that the right thing happens. We had the opportunity to have Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan come to iLabs this past summer. And when I look at the work that we are doing, I recognize that we are not just on the brink, but in the midst of research that will fundamentally change the way that we educate our children and help ameliorate the education gap that is currently breaking apart the fabric of this nation. When Secretary Duncan says that education is the civil rights issue of our generation, I feel confident that this organization, we were talking today, we were talking this evening about places that have parts of our soul involved in them. You guys have my brain and my soul. <laughs> when I look at the work that we are doing as an organization, I know that it is going to help resolve that civil rights issue. And so when I think about the role that SVP has played in this organization, I recognize that while iLabs is not a traditional SVP grantee, it didn't get the $75,000 grant and we didn't then put it into the cycle of reviews. It is an incredible SVP success story because of what Bill, myself, many other SVP partners, and many other amazing volunteers have done to help us get to this place and change the world 
even though we were breaking a couple of the rules. Thank you.